Hey everybody, Dave Lindbergh in Hong Kong with a new episode of THD Podcast. Today we have a company joining us from Germany uh, called Elevir, and uh, they've got some interesting technology. If you've ever had personally reading up on this prior, you ever had that issue where you're yelling with your headphones on because you can't hear because you're occluded? This technology, uh, one of the solutions it offers is to somewhat solve that issue, so we're going to find out if I don't understand it, and we're going to get more information on that in a moment. But without delay, let's say thanks to the Alti Association. Um, they'll be at the High End Show in Munich coming up in May, so we encourage people to uh, get involved with Alti or check them out if you're uh, attending that show in uh, Munich. So without delay, let's say hello. We got Simon in Japan this afternoon. Hello, Simon. Hey, Dave. Hey, Dan. And we have Stefan Liebig, the CEO and co-founder of Elevir. Thanks for joining us today, Stefan. How are you doing? It's my pleasure. Uh, thank you for the invitation over here. Okay, so um, let's not waste people's time. Let's uh, get right into this and uh, and see if, if my kind of little summary is even closely <laughs> to accurate. So maybe you want to share a presentation for us. Yeah, I will. Just give me a second. Um, yeah, nice. Um, so I, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, today I'm representing Elevir. Uh, the motto that we have is Elevate Your Hearing. And we develop any kind of algorithms for headphones, hearing aids, uh, hearables, and so on. And we are focusing on different problems. And as you said, like yelling with your own voice is certainly one of them. Um, I did a PhD on occlusion cancelling, which is basically the feeling that you're feeling muffled. You don't, ha you don't know how loud you are when you're talking with headphones on. Um, mm -hmm. And we have something that is uh, actively taking care of that. But it's just one of the technologies, and I'm going to jump into this in a second. Okay. So okay. um, just to give a little bit of background for the company. Uh, so we've been founded in, uh, April, uh, in, in February 2021. We're located in Aachen in Germany and we are started from the university over here. So from FET Aachen University and um, we started the research on the different technologies in 2013. So quite a bit of time went by, it's like 11 years right now. Um, we had uh, so obviously some journey with funding, uh, different grants, uh, now VC funding round and we have an interesting combination of people that joined the company. So we have people that were involved in the GSM codec on the Philips side. Uh, we have people that were involved in uh, MPEG-H uh, from Technicolor side. Uh, we have um, one of our co-founders is from Dolby, was responsible for Dolby Atmos um, for the licensing business there. And then we have people on the technical side that joined in. And basically, we are a combination of like industry experts and people that are actually doing the hard work of the research and development. Okay. And what we actually do is we offer patented licensing products based on the spheres of research, claiming to solve the biggest pain points in modern hearables. So some of them is like the own voice perception, some is how I perceive my environment, and some is how I perceive the virtual world. So basically it's covering all of these different areas that you might have, uh, but specifically also taking care of the person that is actually wearing the device because they also should feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And in terms of that, we have different products that we're offering. Uh, which we are extending at the moment as well. So the one that we started with is Oclear. That's about occlusion cancelling, natural self-perception. should help you with the uh, all-day wearability and cancel the, especially this boomy feeling that you typically have with, with your earbuds. So basically, if you're walking or if you're eating or if you're talking, all of that uh, is something that we're tackling. We also do something about ANC, it's related, um, and a lot of people like to get those two things together. So we have optimized hybrid ANC tuning. Uh, we are consulting on enhancing acoustics, so sometimes the headphone needs to allow for a certain performance because the best algorithm cannot fix a, like a wrong microphone position, for example. And we do this robust by design. So all of these like howling issues that you typically have, something that we specifically tackle. And more and more is also going the direction of adaptivity. So as you know, it's like you want to be adaptive to like fit to the situation and also to the people. Uh, that's the direction that it's going. Okay. Um, then some time ago, we developed um, idle noise reduction, which is taking care of a specific, very specific problem that where the implications are pretty big. So idle noise comes from microphone and system and then the amplification of the filters. And um, we have a software approach to tackle this which basically means you can get more transparency with less noise. You can use lower SNR microphones and still get like a very good performance out of it. And when we did a comparison and I have like some measurements later on where we compare to the best hearables in the market and like show where, where we land with this. Okay. Um, and then also about the kind of virtual content, we have one approach uh, which is taking care of head rotation. We call this Dino. 
Um, and it's basically, it is not doing an externalization, but it's really rotating very cleanly the signal. So if you ever, ever uh, like put on like some kind of spatial audio feature and it really changes how things are sounding, we specifically don't do that. We just rotate the audio and we're independent of the Playdeck device. So it's something integrated into the, into the headphone. And by that, we maintain the high audio quality and have very low latency. So something mm -hmm. where you, for example, say, um, you have Apple Music, you have a pre-rendered sound, you want to preserve what, what they are doing um, with, the, with the stuff that they present you. And you, want, you still want to have this immersive and interactive component that's specifically taken care of here. Hmm. And all of these technologies um, that we're presenting are tested and readily developed, and we have real-time demonstrators that we then typically, when we interact with customers, just ship to them. They can test them internally because um, me telling something is obviously one piece, but having it in your own hand and really having the engineers to listen to it and test it out is the thing that's in the end convincing people. Okay. So um, yeah, if, uh, if things are there, uh, then certainly reach out to look into this. So from the current status perspective, we have the software reported to commercial silicon. We are supporting different platforms. We have a growing number of leading audio partners that are there, uh, analog devices, Qualcomm, Cadence, Sonical, Green Waves. You certainly uh, saw a few on this podcast as well. Um, yep. And this is this list is also extending. And then typical shows that you find us on are listed here as well. Uh, so we've been big on CES this year. There were, there was uh, very nice and successful. And there's going to be Embedded World, IFA, ICASP, uh, Integrated Systems Europe, and so on. And also high end, which is one of the shows. Okay, that we're good, doing. good. Um, in terms of markets and values, what we do is uh, we provide a clear competitive advantage by our features and increase the ASP. So basically, it's something where like really user perception is uh, perception is much in, increased um, because we have this all developed and ready to go. It's the fast time to market, and then for. And you have to say, like, for, for ANC-ready headphones, we have no additional hardware, and it's only an algorithm and software part. And what's the re ASP? Uh, there's so many acronyms in this world. What, what does ASP the mean? In the the average Sorry? selling price. So basically okay. what we yeah, say yeah. is that, for, let's, say, let's take the ANC part as an example. So everybody wants to have, like, really good ANC. Yeah. And um, we really tune a lot out of the systems. Um, so that means that basically you can say uh, we have something that's really competitive okay. from that perspective. In terms of where it can actually be, the, the typical one that comes into mind are hearables because they're anyway smart devices. Um, we, we also see like a lot of uh, demand for perception is something that we do right now, uh, is communication headsets. I see you see that I have one, but this is an open headset. Um, so basically because I really like to hear myself in a natural way. Um, and it's yet to be kind of determined how to do this with like closed headphones, I would say. We also look into the smart smart glasses area. So basically that is something where, um, especially the spatial audio feature might be interesting. AR, VR and gaming is an interesting one. Hearing aids, any monitoring and also hearing protection. Um, so there's something, we combine different features into the device and hearing mm -hmm. protection is something that we added recently, uh, which is something that really helps with like the overall perception. Mm -hmm. I'm jumping a bit more into detail. I'm just going to go through like a few of the, the products. So clear, the adaptive acoustic transparency and occlusion cancelling. And just to bring us all kind of on the same page, um, typically when you think about transparency, then people think about ambient. So how do I hear my environment? I want to hear if like a bus passes by, if there's an announcement or something. But what a lot of people like don't look at is actually how does the user sound like? So um, if I am talking to somebody, do I hear myself very loudly? Do I talk louder than normal? Because I, I lose the perception. And that has to do with the body conducted sounds and the air conducted sounds of your own voice. And the your own voice is something that you're really, really sensitive to because you hear yourself more than anything because you always have yourself with you in a way. Right. So what we do in terms of uh, the, the approaches that we take, we tune for transparent ambient and natural own voice. So we specifically take care of this. We adjust to different people and varying levels of occlusion. So we said like user specificity is something that's important. All three of us have a different occlusion effect and different ears. So that's something you need to adapt to. And ideally you don't want to touch the system. So it should also happen automatically. That's uh, something that we have in the system. It, yeah, it really makes sense for the in-ear monitoring so people know if they're singing in tune because they can be a little bit more quickly in, in touch with how they're sounding today. 
if they need more honey tea or something to to loosen the vocal cords it could be and i i can see the application there interesting yeah and then um the last thing that we typically also couple with the whole thing is a smart treatment of quiet and loud environments and um, typically what helps is when you look at like different situations, you might have at the low end, you have a quiet bedroom or a quiet office where you're working. I'm now sitting at home uh, in, in my home office and it's pretty quiet over here. Over there, you would hear a lot of hiss noise in the devices. So that's the idle noise that I mentioned before. And then if you go out, then basically you might want to have devices which you're wearing in certain situations in the subway. It's very loud over there. Uh, you might use them. So I do it sometimes work in a workshop and then I have my headphones on and I really want to get rid of uh, like all of the saw noises, for example. Or uh, what you see nowadays as well is some hearing protection that's specifically designed for people going to concerts. Um, so mostly passive at the moment, but I see this coming as an active piece as well. You want to enjoy the music, it should be transparent, but it doesn't need to be like 110 dB. So that's something you want to take care of. And then basically we have features for this built into the whole thing. So we have personal hearing protection taking care of the high end and idle noise reduction for the low end. So it, mm. uh, it should really take care of like all of the, the, the range to give you a very nice perception for all of the situations. Okay. Um, I brought like a few measurements to give you an idea of um, how the things are looking like because me talking about it again is something which is nice, but seeing and then also hearing at the end is believing there. So we measured something over here, which is an open ear versus closed ear. So you see over frequency, the insertion gain for comparison. And this now is own voice excitation. So people were actually reading a sentence. We were recording microphones and then we can compare device off so open ears versus closed ears and device off and device on. Device off is the, the blue one and device on here is the red one. And you can assume in this one that close to zero dB is better. Um, you see that for an off situation, you are going up quite a bit. This is the boomy feeling that you have of your own voice. So basically- Sorry, so off, off means the device is powered off. Correct, yes. It's, it's acting as a passive headset kind of thing. Yes, yeah. right. 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 So this is a relatively decently occluding one. So you see it goes up to 40 dB uh, at the low end. So you will have a lot of like rumbling noise and your own voice sounds very deep. Um, and at the same time, you're losing the high end. Um, so higher frequencies, the air conducted part is, is missing. So something where you say, okay, voice is more relevant above like 80 Hertz. We typically consider that um, because here there's less, less uh, frequency content for the voice inside. And what you see is that you, we have different things over here that, that are happening. If you look at the, at the range, and I'm just going to go back for a second. If you look at the range over here, you see quite a big spread. So I said like occlusion is different for every person. This is exactly what I mean. Um, you see that for the same device, making sure that the fit is more or less comparable, we still see like a lot of spread for occlusion and basically bring everything down to a very similar level. So that's something where we adjust to the different levels of occlusion. And I brought a second example. So this is an in-ear device. Typically, in-ear is more associated with occlusion, but it also happens in over-ear devices, depending on what you have. Uh, this is an over-ear design, and you see this even more uh, severe over here. So basically, the spread really going down and being at like a very kind of consistent level, I would say. And then also what you want to look for is something which um, is a wide range where you're pretty natural in a way. So I, I said like, noise is a problem in typical headphones so the idle noise reduction actually enables us to tune for higher bandwidths for transparency and then also for the own voice so that is something which is fairly wide band in that sense so basically occlusion cancelling just to repeat uh, recap very quickly is it helps you hearing your own voice more naturally so i can talk and i feel like i don't have anything in my ears uh, I'm being more aware of the loudness of my own voice, which is like in open office situations is quite a big pain point. Yeah. And I generally have increased comfort and all the wearability. So if I really have a device I want to take with me, I want to wear in the office, I want to walk through the street, I want to be in the train, and I can still like have a phone call in the evening maybe, all those should be covered. So like all the wearability is certainly a thing. Okay. Does does the occlusion effect, does that contribute to fatigue and hearing? Like 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 headphone there's in gaming especially there's fatigue from people listening to headphones all the time but if they're actually in a in like a bi-directional situation where they're talking into a boom or something is trying to 
understand if you're at the right level does that cause fatigue as well i suppose I would say when you your own voice sounds off, you are irritated to some extent. Right. You probably get used to it over over some time, but to be honest, even with like these headphones, they're pretty open. But even if I have like a long meeting uh, afternoon and then I take them off, I really still feel like oh, pff, this is relieving. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So from, from my perspective, I would say that I don't have a study that I could cite um, mm -hmm. that says like okay, this is really more in fatigue. But from my, my personal experience, I can definitely say I feel this, and I, I feel that. Most of the people know this problem. Yeah. So, and, and to be honest, um, I have different devices because obviously we test a lot of headphones as well. Um, if I have a phone call and I'm walking around, then having this like robota sound from my footfall mm -hmm. is also super annoying for me. So I'm typically for phone calls, I just take open devices and I need to accept that it's loud outside sometimes, mm -hmm. but because I really can't stand this for a long time. Right. Yeah. Okay. So it's personal right. interest in like getting this. Right. <laughs> Good. Um, I, I also wanted to give you like a little bit of background um, and more information on the idle noise reduction. Um, so the problem comes from limited SNR and miniature microphones. So most microphones typically nowadays, and maybe correct me if I'm not super up to date there, uh, in a range of 66 dB to 73 dB. And then the ANC and transparency creates an audible noise floor. So basically that's due to the filters. You want to give something back. Um, that is certainly a thing. And um, yeah, it's mostly in this quieter environments where we are. Uh, but I have a feeling that they all happen for a lot of people happen more often than we think. Because if you have one device that you want to take for everything, then you would also have it at home and listening to music and so on. And then I have few people in my direct vicinity that are saying, ah, it's, it's too noisy and this is too annoying. Mm -hmm. So we have something for that that is reducing the hiss by 10 to 15 dB. Um, so quite considerable. And it's just a software component. So let's say that you uh, are here paying for 7 dB improvement on a MEMS microphone. And then what is it an additional cost for one microphone? And we have something yeah. that you can drop in as software. It could so. be quite significant. I mean, the, the range could be, you could save 70 cents per unit probably because a, a low cost MEMS is maybe 30 cents. And... The premium ones that go to 73 are up around a dollar or more. Yeah, and then basically you have multiple of those. And then the thing is that you have a certain limit that you can't reach. So basically you could also improve a good SNR microphone and make it really nice. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, I think it uh, it provides a lot of value in this sense. Okay. And the interesting thing is we did, um, I have an investigation that we did where we did a comparison. We took cheaper hardware and compared it to the market leader. Um, and um, you will see how this is coming out. Okay. But generally, what it enables, so it's, it's, it sounds like a minor problem, but it enables a lot of things. So it enables more wideband transparency up to 10 kilohertz. And then also what you see is that there is this mode where you might have some automatic uh, functionality that is switching between ANC and transparency, and you want to have like some balance and it's supposed to automatically adjust. You have the problem that in the transparency, you have more noise. So you want to be very wide band, but you also want to be consistent over this. So the technology is also helping in a lot of kind of round situations, making things possible in a sense. Mm. Good. Let's let's jump into like the measurements and just have a quick look. So what I'm what I'm showing is insertion gain measurements, measured in an acoustic isolation booth. We have a diffuse field pink noise for speaker excitation, and we calculate active versus open ears. So you're going to see the plot like this. Uh, frequency over the insertion gain, and we say the target is zero dB again. But it's close to zero dB, as I said. Yeah, um, we have idle noise reduction increase. So um, we measured again in the isolation booth. We want it to be really quiet, and we calculated the A-weighted dB um, SPL of open ears versus the active earbud inserted. So basically, let's say that I don't have a device inside, and I compare this to I have headphones inside because I want to be almost as if my ears are uh, empty in a way. So if I have open ears. And then basically what we see is that there will always be, always be some increase, but the level makes a difference. So there is better if you lower. Mm -hmm. And then jumping into this, we took a low price earbud with the original firmware. Um, we, we measured this, we uh, end up at like a roughly 8 dB SPL increase. Uh, but you see that the transparency is not very wideband. So they shelve off at like one kilohertz. In this in this case 
Then we took the same earbud, we wired it out and we had our evaluation kit and our software on it, did a design and did a wideband transparency design, just as a usual one to do. And then you would see that there's a significant increase in the idle noise. That's what that's to be expected because basically the microphone noise here in the upper frequency bands, they would be boosted quite a lot. Mm. Then we dropped in our software. And what's nice is that we reduce the, um, the idle noise by 13 dBA. And at the same time, we keep the transparency at the same level. So the nice thing is that this increase of noise that's coming from the upper frequency ranges is compensated in this one. Um, and that, thereby you can have the benefit of both worlds in a way. And when you do a comparison to the gold standard with original firmware, then you would see that the transparency is comparable. So we shelve off at like seven kilohertz for this one. It sometimes goes up to 10 kilohertz. Um, so this is something that depends still a little bit on the device, um, but there was a, some design decision. And you see that the idle noise increased is also comparable. So with cheaper hardware, we actually get kind of really similar performance. Okay. Good, so just to, to recap this one, uh, when we include idle loss reduction as a component in our piece, then you can be in a quiet room and have no hiss. Uh, you can have more transparency and more spatial awareness because higher frequency contribute to you hearing the direction and everything. And you can use cheaper, cheaper microphones and achieve similar performance. Mm -hmm. So adding a lot of benefit and the ODM is typically like the last one. Right, okay. Good. Third component is this one, personal hearing protection. So we have loud sounds that can damage your hearing and then basically hearing uh, hearables or hearing protection, they offer a really unique uh, opportunity to control the loudness. So we are all walking around and I, I recently became a father, <laughs> this is a little yeah. side story. Um, and the little one was like crying a lot at the beginning. And you really want to hear when he's somewhere in the house and crying because you want to attend and like, take care of him. But then if he's next to your ear, this is like really tricky. So <laughs> what our technology actually does is in the situation when I have him here and he's crying, it's really taking care of my hearing because I get so irritated if it's too loud. And then I'm more relaxed and he can relax also much faster. So there's a lot of benefit in like using something like this. Um, again, looking at this one, so we have like a common image. So we take care of the higher end, um, so the personal hearing protection. And what we do is we protect the ear from sudden loud noises um, with ultra low latency suppression and recovery. And I'm going to have a, um, a measurement of that as well. Also, long term exposure. We maintain the natural directional sound. So let's say that you have something that comes from a certain direction that is still maintained. And you can even, when the loud sound uh, occurs, so let's say that there's something like this. You can still hear everything else with natural direction, directional hearing, which is quite nice because a lot of the hearing protection, they go down and then they're gone and they go up again. And that doesn't happen for us. Um, and generally it keeps the sound characteristic unchanged when the loudness is acceptable. Hmm. So to like indicate this a bit, and there's something that we're gonna um, also present at conferences, um, when you have the headphone off, this is measured at the eardrum and it's a time domain recording uh, of like some sound events. You see that there is a large um, sudden sound event coming and then we are attacking and we're also releasing again. So from that perspective, that's taken care of. And the, the nice thing is especially kind of this, as I said, like the directionality preservation uh, that we have built into it. Hmm. In terms of long-term exposure, these are some measurements that are showing how it's doing so the for 60 dBA, we kind of keep it the same. And then something is happening when it's getting louder and then something more is happening when it's getting really loud. That's something that's configurable. So maybe there are there different standards out there for hearing protection. Uh, we should also be able to um, be compliant with them. Uh, but this is one tuning that we did in the past. So that's nice thing about algorithms. Sometimes you can tailor them to the needs of a customer. Mm -hmm. Good, a very quick um, repetition of this one. So we protect your hearing in loud environments. We um, enable you to work longer and more concentrated. So basically if it's loud and it's sudden, sudden noises are occurring and then you're irritated, then you want to have something like this um, so that you can just continue and be concentrated. Mm -hmm. I want to very quickly just touch on the idle noise reduction and I didn't talk about like something like latency or, or stuff before, um, but we really focus on having something which is natural. And for hearing devices, as hearing aids, you have the problem that 
your processing sound and the passive sound get, still gets in and then the processed sound comes on top and if you have like a certain latency between the two it sounds really unnatural because you have like comb filter effects and then you might hear like two sound events if you're really too slow um, so you don't have much time and what's really tricky to achieve is having something which is very low latency in the processing and still gives you like smart features and this one generally increases um, the SNR for microphones as well as vibration sensors so just very quickly uh, touching on this, Knowles, for example, re released a new um, digital uh, vibration sensor. So it's voice pickup, which is typically more robust against background and wind noise. But the problem is then the SNR for own voice is very, very low because of uh, the coupling of the device to the, to the ear and to the head. And the noise floor of these devices is also pretty high. So the SNR in general that you get is not very good. Uh, and the direct use of this vibration sensor signal renders the noise very audible. You can still do like sophisticated noise reduction if you do it for a far end. So let's say I have a telephone telephone call. For the far end, it's nice. But if you're at the near end and you actually want to improve something for the user, you need to be very fast. And then what we've built, I don't have a, a plot for that, but I just wanted to indicate this, um, is something that significantly reduces the noise floor, as we saw before. And the noise reduction is also uh, way below one millisecond from the latency. So mm -hmm. something that is, really below the threshold when you when you hear any kind of differences right okay um, i'm very quickly touching on uh, anc so what we have is a robust wideband anc that we tailor to our customers devices um, we did a comparative uh, comparative study where we took uh, samsung galaxy buds 2 pro we wired them out uh, we have access to all microphones and loudspeakers we made sure that the acoustics are the same and then what we did is we uh, can compare to the stock. So just what you can buy off the shelf, it's the, the red one. And we have our tuning over here where we um, specifically targeted to have wide band attenuation and something which is more perceivable for humans. So you can, and this is a big debate, for ANC you can do, tune as, as, as much as you want for a dummy head and you can achieve a very good performance on this one, but it does not always generalize very well for humans. This is something that we consider and also we consider what humans are actually really hearing so this was the um, tuning and uh, an algorithm that we presented at cs and um, the wideband part especially takes care of the babble noise that you have there so generally what we have is hybrid anc tuning capabilities we're robust against howling and clipping so if you like for example close the sound outlet of your device is typically a problem if you take them in hand and then you kind of make an enclosure a lot of times you have howling um, that's all, all no problem for us. We have wideband attenuation up to three kilohertz for, especially for this babble noise situation. And we add, adapt to user's perception and uh, there's more adaptation to come. So that's, mm -hmm. that's certainly a direction that's very interesting to see because what you want to have in the end is a device that you can hand to like a lot of different people and there's consistent performance for all of them, uh, which is not, not easy to get. Mm -hmm. So um, we, what we offer there, in, in, including uh, our ANC, means that you're getting more than 30 dB of attenuation, up to 3 kilohertz. We had to add with the market leaders and also adapt to user's perception in that sense. Okay. Last piece, um, Dyno, the head rotation compensation that I mentioned. Yeah. Um, what, where this comes from is user's demand for spatial audio features in their hearables. And the current solutions, um, they also, they, they, a lot of times they suffer from motion to sound latency and a closed ecosystem that's changing slightly uh, and opening up a bit more. Um, but the thing is that a lot of the devices still have kind of um, uh, an architecture where you have a head tracker, a head tracking signal sent down to some source, uh, audio source, some phone, for example. And then something has changed and it's circled back. So over there you have like round trip delay that is a tricky piece. And there are some solutions out there which also do something on the device itself, but then they change the kind of characteristics of the sound. So we set out to not doing that, and we don't want to add additional reverb because it, it's a taste thing. Do you want this? Is this intention of the of the artist? I don't know, um, but mm -hmm. we definitely want to have something that's very clean. So what we did is we integrated Dyno into the devices. Um, so it's still using head tracking signal because you want to adjust to head rotation, uh, mm -hmm. but it's only changing, I mean, it's only operating on two channels and it's only changing the direction and not changing kind of the characteristic. So 
basically the easiest way to understand what it's doing um, is when you talk to people that are doing uh, working in this field. So we analyze the audio scene and then we re-render to the head rotation, which then basically means that we maintain the audio identity in the direction. And it also is not dependent on the number of sources. So let's say you have an orchestra, uh, which like many different different sources. Um, it is not getting worse than it's actually helping in a way because human perception is also less sensitive to like a lot of different instruments at the same time than to one individual where they can really focus on something. But both works equally well in that sense. Mm -hmm. And the competition that um, that is there is simulating typically typically virtual loudspeakers adds sometimes an artificial reverb and then changes the audio identity and the direction. And this also it has it has uh, like certain applications which is not where this might be nice, but it's something where we see that there is a market gap for having something which is really clean and really conserving the the quality. Hmm. So just talking about like the different areas because for spatial audio this is sometimes a debate. So where do you actually want it and where do you need it? Um, so what you see at the moment is like uh, the music and the movies part. Um, you see something which where, where we where we see this and this is actually my son. So we um, have uh, self-made videos where you might, might be recording memories and then you want to relive them and make them interactive in the best sense. Mm -hmm. And on the audio side, we already give you that interactivity. So you can have a recording by your phone. And if you are then using our technology, you can rotate your head and feel this, feel more like you're in the scene in that sense. Mm -hmm. It also makes sense for situations like ours, video conferences where you might have spatial audio features like Teams or Zoom are introducing gaming setups where preserving the, the, the audio identity also means preserving the direction where sound is coming from. So let's say that I'm, I'm a competitive gamer and I am playing in a, in a tournament and I really want to hear where things are coming from. If I can use like slight head movements, it's helping the human brain a lot to identify where things are coming from. So mm. in normal day situations, you would be doing this to like identify where things are coming from. You look around and even for gaming, there, there are studies which say that there is a certain range on your monitor that you still, where you're just like staring on it and not moving, but then you're still doing like slight head movements anyway. Um, to like screen, like uh, identify yeah. the screen and identify where everything's going. So it's a natural thing. And then our technology would actually help you to identify better where things are coming from. Mm. And then the mm. last one, which is AR, VR, and also going into the smart glasses thing, um, that's an architecture uh, advantage that the technology has. So let's assume that um, you want to have something which is really low power. So some glasses where my... my my battery is like super thin. Mm -hmm. I can't afford to do like a full rendering in the device because then my battery would be empty directly. What I want to do is I want to smartly distribute where things are happening. The problem is when you want to have something that's really convincing, you need to have some pieces that are really, really fast and happening at the edge. And adjusting to head rotation is one of them. Because as you see, like if you're transmitting forth and back, this is not helping so much. So if you have something in your device, which really, and our technique has a really small footprint, which changes the audio based on your head rotation with, with a really, really small footprint, you can off, uh, offload the large processing to some other place. So might it be in the cloud or might it be on a phone or on a watch? Doesn't matter in this case. Mm -hmm. So the architecture advantage is also there. Okay. Um, so basically, that means that um, if you go through and uh, you make any audio interactive, you preserve the audio quality, you naturally interact with the audio scene and have instantaneous head tracking. So you could also like really shake it very fast, which is typically breaking down in uh, most of the current technologies. And you have it fully integrated in the headphone. So it's also compatible with a lot of different other sources that might come from somewhere. Okay. Good. And then lastly, um, obviously, I presented like a few technologies to give you like a good overview. Um, but the question is also how to work with us. So from that perspective, what we do is we integrate technology. So that's service-based thing. We evaluate things uh, to make sure that everything's working fine. And then we are supporting the product. And in the end, there's a licensing. So we don't build devices ourselves. We license into uh, manufacturers. And an integration stage, for example, that we typically go through is something where we have an uh, 
we have demonstrators that we ship to customers. That's an evaluation based on our choice, uh, our headphone. We have something where there might be a pilot project. So our technology on your device. So mm -hmm. they, they send us a prototype. We are designing everything. Then there might be some pieces where there's, uh, there's a product integration. Sometimes you can skip the pilot project, um, depending on how close we are on your device. Um, so basically, that's something where we directly integrate into uh, production samples. Then you go into production, we support that. And then the market launch is also supported by us. And then based on volume-based licensing, this comes in. So it's something that's quite typical in the industry. Um, and from that perspective, I'm through with my presentation. And I, I thank you for, for listening over here. OK. I have a couple right. of questions, if you don't mind. So um, I mentioned. <clears throat> You um, uh, showed based on analog devices and uh, Qualcomm were the two that are kind of recognized. Um, what happens to people that are using a variety of different Bluetooth chips? Is it, would it be normal to add a separate DSP to handle this stuff? Um, depends a bit on what you're working on. I also mentioned Cadence. So obviously Cadence yep. with their hi-fi cores is uh, very widely used. Um, so what we saw is that um, a lot of the Chinese and Asian manufacturers in general are building in more and more hi-fi cores. So it's going to be like, I don't know, two hi-fi four, two hi-fi five, uh, sometimes hi-fi mini to be like really, really power, cons uh, um, not power hungry. Mm -hmm. um, so from that perspective, what I say is all our algorithms are ported to um, different uh, hi-fi cores. So we have fixed point and floating point implementations and then dropping them into this is a question of framework. And we see that there are different um, different providers that are coming up that ease this pain of integration. Um, and then basically, that's the direction that we're also taking. So you saw Sonic on the list already. There's Bragi. Uh, there's DSP concepts with the audio weaver. Um, that's all the direction that's going. And I just couldn't tick it off yet. Let's say this way. Uh, uh, when a customer comes with a uh, project, so uh, you, as you say, you're licensing essentially the IP or software uh, set. Um, uh, is there any case where a customer would uh, develop it themselves or does it require that your team uh, do the tuning, let's call it, hmm. the configuration and tuning? Because every every product yeah. would be different, uh, right? True. Yeah. yeah, typically what happens is when we go through the different stages, and let me just go back to, to this one. So um, obviously the journey for every customer is different. Um, because they, there might be customers which really say like, we have our specific sound and we have our own target curve and really want to go that direction. And then you want to have something where you're enabling them to get the benefit, but they still have, they're still at the steering wheel in a way. So what we would do is then, for example, we say we integrate, uh, we help you to do this to the best of our taste. We might be doing iterations with feedback from them, but we might also enable them to tune these things to their taste. So both is both is happening and working. And I specifically mentioned, for example, the idle noise reduction, because um, we saw that there is a demand in the market for solving this specific issue um, and not taking maybe the whole piece, but taking like a component that's really helping the audio engineer that needs to do the kind of trade-off tuning because they are really always having a pain with the, with the idle noise. So from mm -hmm. that perspective, I think it's an important question. Um, and I think we enable people as well. Okay. Um, I imagine, especially in the beginning, uh, it's rather complicated. So uh, there'd be plenty of engineers who are familiar with uh, tuning or ANC, let's say, but um, it sounds like what you're doing is a slightly different approach, and so it's not as obvious what you, how to how to interact with those tools, I guess. I mean, basically, we solve one of the one of the issues that are there in the room, and then the normal tuning tools can still be applied from that perspective. So, okay. so that that would not necessarily require that there is a super different approach. Um, but the thing is that obviously we would need to make sure that that also the best performance comes out of our block so that the customer is satisfied with what comes out of that one. So there will still be an interaction, but uh, I would say from what I see, the interaction is not super big. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, in my experience, uh, quite often uh, some, uh, let's say people in marketing or management might not understand that uh, 
the performance of the acoustics and those components fundamentally limit everything else. So, uh, you know, how do you deal with customers who come and say, okay, we've got this fantastic technology, let's implement it in my earbuds and say, sorry, the earbuds are a disaster. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's obviously a difficult one. Uh, yeah. The thing is that we have a capability of doing very early in the stage um, investigations on performance limits. Um, so then basically could, based on our tools and some, some mathematics in the background and simulations and so on, um, can give an estimation of this and then steer in the right direction. So um, it depends a bit on the stage when we come in. So uh, as you say, sometimes maybe the, the acoustics are very challenging. So then we have to deal with them to the best extent, but it's not always possible to get like a performance of the market leaders out of a device that it was like done in a month or something. Um, Mm -hmm. So uh, traditional uh, ANC stuff, uh, you will generally have a, uh, a trimming stage and production to compensate for component variations. Is the same true for your setup? That's that's also true. Typically, that will be done by the ODM, um, and then depends on like who's doing the tuning anyway. So from yeah. that perspective, yeah. Okay, and uh, you know, generally people would just be uh, the most common thing is to adjust a trim uh, gain for feed mm -hmm. or feedback filter. Uh, do you delve a bit deeper into it to make a compensation for frequency response shape? Um, there are different ways of compensating this. It's also a question of like how long it takes in the production, how long there's a time for for each of mm -hmm. the devices. I would say there are, without going into too much detail, there are limitations on just doing the gain um, because obviously yeah. like acoustics is sometimes about like okay i have a resonance over here the resonance is shifted so actually just compensating again is not covering everything um, and there are also there are solutions out there that already do some tuning part, part so from that perspective i think that's something which is partly solved already and what i expect is um, actually that the perception uh, so sorry that the that the kind of generalization when you go into more adaptation is getting better um so basically then there might be something which is taking care of some of the issues that you have so you would still need to like sort out pieces that are obviously false produced um and yeah. and identify the errors but if there's mm -hmm. just like a variation in terms of like production um then in my, in my opinion you can compensate for some of that in, by adaptation hmm. Yep. And um, uh, we're talking about the uh, occlusion effect and secondly, the ANC stuff. From your point of view, are they essentially the same thing? You're just uh, trying to get a different end result with a similar similar processing structures? You can. I mean, but the thing is that obviously, if you want to squeeze out the best performance, sometimes you need to do something which is problem specific. So... And the target is slightly different uh, in terms of both. Obviously, you want to adjust to kind of different people. And you might have like a target function. One is like, okay, just attenuate. One is like, you want to be transparent. Uh, but then at the same time for ANC, a lot of times like own voice is not a thing that you consider. Um, adjustment for kind of these different levels of occlusion is not a thing. Mm. So I would say if you want to get the best performance, it might be good to have a sophisticated algorithm. This is the reason why I talked about tuning mm -hmm. as well as algorithm. Um, and obviously, if you want to get kind of the best performance out of it, there is a reason why we integrated the different features like idle noise reduction and the hearing protection, because basically you want to have them uh, to get the most out of it. Yep. Excellent. Really interesting stuff. All right. Thanks. Okay, so good stuff. Uh, Stefan, any, any final thoughts that you'd like to add? No, but I'm really, I'm really happy that I could join over here, and I'm uh, looking forward to seeing this on YouTube and distributed, and cool. um, then maybe also coming back for an update after some time. Let's see absolutely. what we come back with. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate that. So everybody, like, subscribe, share, all that good stuff, and uh, I guess we'll we'll see everybody in the next episode. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.